Okay, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's very kind. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about building confidence in games user research. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, this talk is for um, persons that are new to the domain, entry level games user researchers. Uh, we're going to go through some foundations and some, but some also some nuanced topics. What is games user research for? Uh, what do we do for games and so forth? Uh, with the idea that we're going to build, hopefully build some confidence together. Uh, we're going to talk about how our shape, uh, work shapes games in development and lots of topics actually submitted by the community uh, and also from mentors and mentees. Uh, we'll talk about that again in a second. If this is not you, if you're not an entry level researcher interested in spending uh, the next amount of time uh, thinking about foundations and the basics of the domain, then maybe the talk next door is for you. Uh, if you want to leave at any time during the presentation, that's fine. This audience is not, uh, you know, yeah, please do go. This, this is not a talk for everyone by any account. Okay. Uh, and if you want to move talks halfway through, we won't take it personally. Uh, yeah, cool. See you guys, enjoy the talk. <laughs> Secondly, although this is a talk uh, written with help from games user researchers uh, across the industry, it's not a definitive perspective on the games user research uh, discipline. Uh, but uh, yeah, well, we'll have time for your questions at the end as well. No, All right, who are we? Uh, so I'm Seb. Uh, I'm a games user researcher for an uh, outsourcing firm called Play Research based in the United Kingdom in Brighton uh, and now in Montreal in Canada. Uh, I provide games user research services with my team to the whole of the games industry. Uh, including teams with both with and without their own internal capabilities. Hi, <laughs> my name is Lainey. So I am a user research analyst at Ubisoft Montreal. And prior to being there, I actually worked as an indie team that we had an embedded user research. So I kind of have both ends of the spectrum, working from small indie teams all the way up to a much larger team like Ubisoft Montreal. So. Getting into this, so Seb and I are actually both members of the steering committee for the GERSIG. So, what is the GERSIG? <laughs> so, you've probably heard this word a couple of times, you've probably seen this word a few times around today. So let's talk a little bit about just kind of who we are as a community and what we do and where we came from. So, we are a part of the IGDA, this is the International Game Developers Association, and this is the first time you've heard this. So the IGDA is a nonprofit association that supports game dev networks and advocates on our behalf. So the SIG, or the Special Interest Group, um, on this domain of games user research, uh, we were registered with the IGDA in 2009, and we are officially the GER SIG, and have been growing ever since. So we, um, we have a small group of elected professionals called the Steering Committee. So there's a few people here probably in the room, Seb and I, um, who help rally initiatives and put events on like this, that you are here, and this is all, this whole event is not for profit and run by a team of volunteers on your guys' behalf. So we have a few other things. We have uh, two annual conferences, obviously this one that you are here at today, and we also have a summit every year in the EU. We also have our mentoring program, which is available for juniors, and those new to the domain, that you can be paired with senior researchers. So if you are either a junior or a senior in here and you would like to be a part of the mentoring program, please come see us. <laughs> we also have a YouTube channel where we have videos of past summit presentations. Uh, we have our Twitter account where we post lots of different articles. People are live tweeting today. So you'll be able to kind of catch up on maybe some of the talks that you missed from earlier today. We also have active chats on our LinkedIn and the Discord channel. And of course, all of these links to all of these resources are available on our website, which is the gamesuserresearchsig.org. So let's jump straight in to our questions. All right, so how does Games You Are make games better? So let's start at the very beginning <laughs> with the idea. So games start out as an idea. The creative team will have a vision for how the game should make players think, how they should feel and behave, and we refer to this as the design intent. When they close their eyes and imagine someone playing through the game, the designer's intent is the vision for the fun and enjoyment and the emotion and the experience they want the players to have. This is something that is really important to us. We don't get to necessarily decide what the intent is, but it's something that we should be able to understand and work with a design team because this is important for us. Sometimes it can be something very specific. So centered around a genre or even just a single mechanic in the game. Sometimes it can be something more esoteric, like telling the story of a lost child. 
So our goal here, though, is to use our skills to explore and clarify that kind of idealized experience of what the intent is. So that when players play, their experience actually ends up matching that designer's intent. So practically speaking, uh, this means contributing throughout the project in kind of two key ways. So we help teams see how their game design manifests in the minds of players by asking them, watching them, and measuring them. Ultimately, we want to understand the players through our research. So by supporting or critiquing the decisions the creative team have to make through player data. So we want to be able to take this information and support them in a way that they feel empowered to make the decisions. And because we're encouraging and justifying change, uh, we're really helping improve the game with them. And it's better because we're involved, because we can help match those two instances together. And we're, it's important to remember that we're not actually the one making the creative choices. We are the impartial judges to help them be able to be empowered with their creative decisions. So we also focus attention on what isn't delivering that experience. So what isn't actually in the intended experience that they had hoped for. And we do this by exploring all aspects of the game. So we can reduce nasty surprises that otherwise mean that something gets left undone or maybe misunderstood. We also bring in knowledge of players, which means we can be proactive and help predict issues that potentially, potentially before even the code has been hardwired in or embedded so deeply that it cannot no longer be changed. And this also means that we can help keep to timelines. We can help them keep to their end goals of creating this vision that they had hoped for. So interchangeably, we're helping by contributing evidence at differing levels. With the player data, we can get a big picture view of the game as a whole. So why do people play? Is it fun? Is the metagame well balanced? And our ability to observe and measure, we can get a, at fine detail more, is this scenario teaching effectively, or is the UI usable under time pressure? And does this one's icon mean something? These contributions ultimately mean high quality games delivered with less risk and on time. So this means the business wins additionally, um, financially, and the development team wins creatively. All right. So Lenny's brought us all up to speed on the individual contributions, and in our own words, uh, how we contribute to game development, so we can all share that. Uh, but a question we get a lot is, where did this come from? Is it a new thing? Is it a trendy thing? Uh, what, what's the origin story? Um, so, the idea of making games for other people, making uh, you know, a board game or something like that, uh, is extremely old, several thousand years old. Uh, but of course we had to wait until the 1958 before we saw our, our, the first video games emerge. The idea, of, a, 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 however, of a job role, of an individual person whose responsibility is to improve stuff by observing people and getting data, uh, is kind of more like 100 years old, from around the Industrial Revolution, contributes to World War I and World War II, uh, when we're trying to make machines that don't hurt people, uh, don't kill people, don't kill our workers uh, and the people that are operating those machines. In the 1980s, uh, when the digital revolution comes, uh, these two worlds crash together and we're frame, reframing it as usability. Uh, and now video games again. In 1972, Carol Cantor of Atari is the first person to recognize as making, um, measuring players' behavior and making a meaningful change in the game by uh, watching how many quarters people were pushing into an arcade machine. Uh, talking through the 1990s and the 2000s, this approach, this discipline, forms around the need to make better games and is adopted in Sony, Microsoft, Ubisoft, and Volition, um, and other, many other places, and formalized and crystallizes around the unique perspective that Lenny is talking about. If we jump to today, most larger game studios and publishers have games user research teams like us, but we've diversified into unique disciplines, uh, all, uh, just some of which are here, I suppose. Uh, analytics, market research, community management, all of us have this player data perspective is making the game better by understanding our players better. And the future is bright, moving forward, thinking about the future. Uh, there's more than 500 games a day released on if you put all the platforms together. Uh, there's a lower barrier to entry, games are increasingly free, there's many more devices. The future is bright for games user research. All right, so we're all up to speed. Where do we come from? What do we do? What is our voice? 
I want to talk about some of the more nuanced topics so we can talk more confidently about what it is we do, be that to game developers or friends and family, or indeed anyone to have confidence in the voice that we have within these teams. How do we get to this data? Why is game user research needed? And a common pushback, you know, why can't we just hire better game designers? Wouldn't that make our games better in the same way? Why can't we just be more thorough? Uh, hiring, the answer is hiring more creatives or just more experienced people doesn't lead to a perfect game. Many problems are solved by that, but some problems don't go away. In fact, some problems get worse in the same way that just having many more cooks, you know? Uh, some of those problems are to do with collaboration. Some of them are to do with creativity. And some of them are to do with business. And I'm gonna go through a few of them now. The core of this question is, without games user research, what happens? How does that affect the design of the game? What effects is games user research trying to counteract? Why are we here? And what is the implication on the game? All right, I'm gonna go through this far. Players' minds and bodies are different to developers' own. The people making and designing the games that we love are often highly skilled, they're dexterous, and they have often many years of practice of playing the game that they're making as a result of playing it every day. As a result, these games can creep upwards in complexity. That's in terms of uh, literacy and numeracy required to play them, the dexterousness, burden on people's memories, reaction times, just general knowledge. The most obvious example of this, and the one that I kind of usually use in this circumstance, would be uh, making games for children because they're so markedly and obviously different to how we think and behave as adults. But it's true that all players are different to us, different to developers, and that can affect the design of the game. And this is an effect that must be counteract counteracted through game user reserve. Secondly, games aren't made in the same place that they're played. Games are often made, sat three feet from a screen, played for eight or ten hours a day by the people making them for years. Yet they're played in every possible way by every possible person. They're played on a bus with one hand, with no sound for a few minutes at a time. They're played once and people get busy and forget and they pick it up again three weeks later. They're played by people with permanent or temporary impairments. Without rolling these perspectives into the design itself, games become intolerant. They become exclusive and that is an effect that needs to be counteracted, again through user research. Games are novel. They often have something that's fresh and something that's new. But anything that's new has to be taught. Anything that new has to be, often has to be understood in order to be enjoyed. But teaching players through the medium of gameplay itself is an incredibly complicated challenge. Humans are fallible. Humans have poor memories. Humans have limited attention. Uh, even more so when we consider the way they're played as opposed to how they're made. And while feedback can be used to correct incorrect behaviours in the game and try and course correct players to doing the right thing, the thing that we want, that's in our design intent. We have to design that feedback. Nothing comes for free in video games. And that's an incredibly difficult task. This feedback has to be designed and then has to be tested with real players. And if you do want to test with real players, it's, incredibly, it's, it's fraught with challenges. Getting good feedback is expensive. Getting good feedback takes time and attention away from the game that you're making. It's also, it was talked about a little bit on the first uh, talk today in the keynote, it's very emotionally difficult to get to gather feedback and to read feedback about the thing that you're making. And one of the things we don't talk about enough, in my opinion, is that uh, actually we help deal with that stress. We help deal with the emotion of hearing and being bombarded with negative feedback about your game and actually balancing it, as was also mentioned, balancing it with positive feedback. Games that have failed for reasons that games user research could have helped with, you know, some of these reasons, don't know what they're missing. There's no retrospective that said, oh, I wish we'd... Lessons are incredibly difficult to learn, which is why we have to be proactive and confident in talking about these topics to try and stop those mistakes being made. As a result of all of these, but maybe in particular the emotional difficulties, it is easier to just opt out of doing games user research. It is easy to just wait until the very last minute where we can change a few things and then, you know? There's a greater exploration of um, some more challenges like this uh, in an article at the resources at the end. This isn't all of them, but I, I think this is the most impactful. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about our risks. 
So let's talk a little bit about how games user research can counteract some of these risks. So developers have a lot of choices to make every, every day, every discipline, every day, sometimes for years throughout the lifetime of a project. So the de developers are not like the players. So this could be psychologically speaking, um, through the way that they're choosing to be teaching this information, the visual communication, or just the ability to process cognitive complexity. Physiologically, they may also be different, like Seb was mentioning, so dexterity, visual, oral activity. Um, the player we imagine playing, the, the player we imagine uh, risks becoming a reflection of ourselves. So we need to kind of keep in mind what that actually looks like. We've all heard the expression, can't see the forest through the trees. So as the creator of something, you're no longer objective about the flaws and the strengths. So games user research brings data and pragmatism to the impact of each game design choice. So one way to do this is using psychology. So the designer may say, I think the player will see this signpost and head that way. And as a games user researcher, we can say, but maybe there's nothing to attract attention to this signpost, and the text is too small on the screen from 10 feet away. This, this perspective can inform change. So another way of informing change is through the player data. With player data, we can check the design. Uh, we thought the signpost would be enough, but we found 60% of the players went the other way. So to get data like this, we use mixed methods of research. So we ask, we observe, and we measure players in different ways because there's no one method to get all the answers we need. Because players often don't know and can't say what they want, we're exploring a lot of nonverbal communication, sometimes fleeting behaviors, and even conflicting information. So a knowledge of psychology is extremely relevant to help begin to unpick this data. And the data doesn't have any value unless it really informs change. So we need to be really specific about the exact aspects of the product that we're researching and why. This goes back to our design intent of really being able to understand that. Additionally, our evidence needs to be on time, it needs to be rigorous, and it needs to be persuasive. So our third contribution is about business. So games are complex, thousands of moving parts, hard to prioritize what matters, and hard to change course. So the signpost issue is having the most negative impact on the game. So let's get our attention on that today. Even if every individual contribution is great, issues arise at the intersection of those individual contributions. So everyone did their best possible work, but our game still isn't experienced as intended, so our game isn't fun. Finally, in game development, game design choices aren't, aren't made in a democracy, so adding some voice of the player sometimes is tough to manage. And after all, devs are players too. So games user research really helps constrain and analyze this player's feedback back for them. So as mentioned, we as games user researchers are not the only voice using players' data and psychology. So there's other disciplines that even use the same tools, um, perhaps focus groups, research, looking at player behavior, completing different reports, and maybe even play tests. Um, we have a lot of similar shared terms, so testing, feedback, quality, issues, blockers. Um, some of these things can even be commonly confused with things like quality assurance. But games user research is unique in that we our remit encompasses all aspects of the game experience. Uh, we have deliberate engagement throughout development from day zero, and sometimes even well into post-launch. Our use of rigorous empirical study and mixed methods helps sets us apart. And additionally, we come from human science backgrounds, which really helps us to understand the players from their perspective and really be able to help provide support for our devs. So I just talked a bit about the talk, uh, types of player data we might be looking at, nonverbal communications and uh, you know, fleeting observations. So how do we source that? How do we analyze that player data? Again, having confidence in talking about these topics lets developers believe in our contribution. At any given time in the game development, teams are going to have questions about their design. They're going to have assumptions that could be addressed at almost any given time uh, across the course of development. And often we're using playtesting or user testing. Uh, it's probably the most famous method of the ones that this discipline uh, owns. But the phrase playtesting, as Lenny mentioned, is sometimes used elsewhere. So for absolute clarity, 
when we hear playtesting, when we hear hearing that phrase talked about here, we're talking about a few key characteristics. Firstly, real players. Members of the general public sought very specifically to play the game. Secondly, mixed methods approach, balancing the use of observation uh, and interview, often over the player's own opinion. And lastly, systematic and focused. Lenny's mentioned the need to be extremely precise about the thing we're looking at in an individual test. We can't just change everything. Again, you heard that in the, the talk this morning. This useless giving data that we can't simply can't action because it's too late in development. So we're doing systematically and focused exploration of the questions that they have today. It is our duty as researchers to design and execute these studies that deliver evidence for the choices being made today, not yesterday or last week. Now there are absolutely loads of methods. <laughs> we do not have time to go through these. This is, this is from Michael Medlock's uh, chapter in the Game Teacher Research book, which was released earlier this year. Uh, but a couple of things to take away. <coughs> Firstly, there's loads. It's not just playtesting. Uh, secondly, uh, they change through the course of development. In fact, playtesting actually comes reasonably late as a result. There's much more work we can do up at the beginning. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to skip slides, so I'm going to wait for you guys to go. <laughs> this is in the book, though. You should absolutely read it. Uh, so there are two chapters actually on methodology design. Michael Metlock's book and there's a play, uh, play research uh, chapter in there as well. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's become, quickly becoming the GER Bible or the, the GER book as we're talking about it. Uh, the Games is a Research book. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> st different studies and methods. So over the course of development, broadly speaking, we're moving from uh, from the micro scale, from looking at the fine detail, as Lenny mentioned, the icons, individual tutorial scenarios, individual mechanics. We're moving from that micro scale over the course of development to the macro scale, the holistic overview of all of these mechanics as they come together, exploring the game as a holistic whole as it comes together. And it's not our only tool, again, as pl more players are pushed through the game, as more players are playing for longer sessions, we've got automated behaviour recording or game analytics, adds richness. Uh, it can be used both to initiate kind of findings and also to explore the impact of our findings uh, in, a, in a transactional way and it's, you know, it's incredibly important. We've got additional tools, we've got maybe eye tracking, we've got maybe biometrics, we've got uh, all sorts of different ways we can observe, measure players. Uh, and we're using them when they're best suited and for the questions that developers bring to us. Maybe our most important tool and where our confidence comes from is through iterative testing. We're not just testing something once and moving on, we're not happy enough with that. We're experimenting, we're iterating, we're finding solutions that are better and understanding why, so that we can move forward confidently through development and avoid the backtracking that costs us so much money. So how do we analyse this data? We've got all sorts of just numbers and notes. How do we get from that to a change being made in the game? So there are many approaches to quantifying this data. Um, there's too many to go through here, but broadly speaking, we're seeking out unintended behaviours uh, or mental models or something the player says, does or feels that is counter to the development intent. So we have to understand the intent first and then find ways to explore it. We can, if we can quantify the design or formalise the design intent, then we can do a direct comparison. And I thoroughly encourage you to, read Sarah, uh, to watch Sarah Lomoskowski's talk on what she calls success factors, about how to quantify intent and in order to, to compare it with studies you can run. Once we have a list of issues, a list of discrepancies, we can prioritise them based on a framework. Which of these issues that you found that are so important should be fixed today versus fixed next week versus fixed next month? We should probably be focusing on those issues that are breaking the experience completely, that are affecting the most players or that are fundamentally getting in the way of that design intent somehow. And we can use frameworks for this. And where does this information go? How does it crystallise into something the team can use? As you heard again in the first talk, because this is the... <laughs> This is the output the developers see. It's, maybe it's the most important part of what we do more than anything else. The method, nothing else matters if the deliverable is not persuasive and on time and, and clear. So typically, uh, it's either a written delivery, as in a written report, or a presentation somehow, maybe even both together. Teams may use internal issue tracking tools like Jira, which you might be familiar with, or Trello, it's like a to-do list managing tool. And the structure of the issues we provide is different between different companies, but it largely follows this. Firstly, prioritization. How important is this? How much should you care? Secondly, an occurrence. What happened? What data have you got that says there's a problem? The causes of that. What, why did this happen? 
And lastly, the impact. How, how impactful is this thing that's happening on, in comparison with the design intent? How long-lasting, how difficult is it to overcome? We're going to take like a really sharp right turn here. <laughs> so we're talking a little bit about the background, kind of what it means to be a game user research. Um, so maybe you're wondering what kind of roles are there for me? Where do I fit in now? I kind of have a little bit of an idea of what I want to do. Um, and we've mentioned that not all games user researchers work in the same way, or in the same capacity, or in the same type of team structure. So let's talk a little bit about what that looks like, generally speaking. So it is very hard to squarely define this for every studio that there is, but we'll do our best to kind of cover the high level. So typically we can think of games user researchers in kind of two different buckets. So we have ones that may be internal, so affiliated to a single company or group, uh, working for a specific studio or company, or we may have external. So they are their own entity and maybe are not tied to a specific company, therefore they can work with different studios working on different games. When we look at the external side of things, we have a group of researchers, which could be working as a studio, doing kind of outsourcing for other, for other larger companies, or we could have our kind of loan contractors or consultants. This varies a lot. If you're interested in talking about this, talk with Seb. <laughs> in the internal umbrella, where I live, um, so we have two types, basically. So we have centralized and decentralized, or embedded. So our central centralized is our central resources are in one place. So we're kind of swapping and working on lots of different games. You may not always be working on the same kind of brand or project, and everything is kind of contained in one central location. Or you might allocate your researchers to one game for a longer period of time and embed them in a larger team. This is not the only ways that this can work. There is also a hybrid model where you could have kind of this different mix of the two. So there's lots of different ways to do this. If you are interested in a little bit more kind of background information on this, Veronica Zavito's chapter in The, the Gerbil is, discusses it a little bit in more detail. So, but regardless of this, we still kind of have the same kind of hierarchy or structure of job roles. The actual titles may vary very differently from different studio to studio, but typically we're gonna have kind of our entry level or junior associate researchers, uh, mid-weight staff, all the way up to senior and management staff. And we may have more layers and we may have different names, but this is kind of a general structure of what you can expect. We also get a lot of questions about the backgrounds and skills that a junior user researcher may need. So based on our 2017 salary survey data, we found we see that 87% of GERs in our community have a bachelor's and that 60% have a master's or PhD. So within that, 34% have a psychology or neuroscience background and 18% come from a UX and ergonomics background. So while getting a PhD is not essential, uh, but bachelor's is near essential, and a domain relevant master's is extremely common. We also get a lot of questions about stats. How much stats do I need? Am I gonna be a data analyst? What am I doing? So a mastery in high level statistics may, may not be completely necessary for your position. This is something that's going to vary a lot. Typically, uh, a solid understanding is going to be helpful. So you're going to understand averages, confidence intervals, and being able to do simple statistical tests, like a t-test, uh, should be enough foundation for most. There's also a short talk from Seb in, from the London Summit uh, in 2015, where he shared a little bit more information from different games research hiring managers across the industry. And that video is on YouTube. It goes into this a little bit more in detail. We also want to make money. <laughs> so based on the salary data, so looking at the entry level positions from, t from our last salary survey, we, s we can see that we have kind of a varied range. We do have updated information about the salary survey. Jonathan Dinkoff is going to be doing a talk on this later. But what we saw when we looked at the numbers for our updated survey is that 
these numbers for the junior weight haven't fluctuated very much. So this is still a pretty good idea of what you can expect. But also keep in mind this doesn't take cost of living into account, so consider that as well. So, uh, you got yourself a job. <laughs> what, what are you doing? <laughs> What is a typical so what is a typical day look like? What are, what are we doing? If you're looking for a job in this space, you want to be knowing what, what your day-to-day -day tasks are like, and actually there's not a great deal of information out there about this. So here, so here we go. Uh, actually, a day in the life is fluctuates a bit. We're working on projects that last between sort of three, fifteen days. So it's much more meaningful to look at a month in the life. So that's what we're gonna do. Projects are base uh, are broken down into three stages. Individual studies are booked in maybe four to maybe 12 weeks in advance. Uh, so that we can look ahead, you know, one to three months and know roughly which games we're going to be working on and uh, what, which parts of those games maybe if we're just working on the one. And again, it's broken into three stages and I'm going to go through them all. First few days is going to be preparation tasks and then testing tasks, the actual days where the player testers are going to attend our offices and lastly the reporting, the analysis and the construction of those deliverables. And I'm going to break these down a little bit more for you. Maybe a week in advance of the test. We're getting our objectives in place. They're coming from the design team. We're going to collaborate with them to work out what should be tested today. What are those choices that are going to be made? Uh, and putting together uh, an idea of who the playtesters we should invite. What's their profile? Do they need to be naive players? Do they need to be expert players? Somewhere in between. Uh, and organizing them to attend for those yellow days, those testing days in the center. At some point in advance of the test, we're going to get one or maybe two builds. Uh, so versions of the game that reflect the current design choices. The reason we might get two is that you know things aren't ready until the last minute and we want it to be absolutely as close to the most current version or current interpretation of the game as possible when we're testing it. So a few days in advance of the test, builds we're going to play through. We're going to familiarise ourselves with them. Why might they break down? How stable are they? What, cho what choices have been made? What's been fixed since the last time we tested it? As close to the testing days as possible, we're going to spend a couple of days putting together a test script or a test protocol. What are the playtesters going to do? What questions are we going to ask? How are we going to ask them? How are we going to mix methods so that we can deliver confidence in our, in our data? Once we've got that test script together, we're going to disseminate it amongst all the people that are helping with the test, maybe five, maybe six people, maybe it's just you, depends on the team you're working with. And we're ready for the yellow days. <laughs> we're going to be playtesting. Members of the general public are invited to our premises somehow. We're putting them through the game experience, we've designed in the script, capturing all that data. When all that's done, and we're uh, so many notes we don't know what to do, we're going to have to start parsing through them, analyzing. Analysis begins, comparing the data, what happened, and how, how much should we care. We're working towards a deadline, because we need to be timely. So on the third day, maybe the fifth day, again, this completely changes depending on the size of the project. We're delivering that deliverable we've designed with the team to them. In between, you can see this look, This one lasts about 12 days, so we can get maybe two of these a month, maybe three in the month if we're really squeezing it. Uh, and they're going to be off-project days, so you've that to look forward to. <laughs> on those off-project days, we're going to be working on process improvements, we're going to be communicating with the dev teams, we're going to be working on side projects, uh, writing articles, who knows what. Uh, so there is buffer time between these projects, but maybe three a month. All right, in summary then, uh, games use research, we need to know that it's a powerful tool and be able to communicate that it is solving deep-rooted challenges in the process of developing games. There are problems with creativity and problems with collaboration and with business. We have confidence in our toolkit of research methods and our backgrounds and applied knowledge of human psychology to deliver data. That data is rigorous, it's on time and it's persuasive to make change in the game, otherwise there's no point in doing what we're doing. In doing so, we are making better games. We're helping them deliver them on time, deliver them on budget, and success comes in many forms, but critically or commercially, they're going to be better received. Okay, we're going to take another left turn. <laughs> <laughs> you have more questions. Yes, well, we, we hope you have more questions. <laughs> so, we actually are going to bring up some of our friends to come help us. So, uh, we like to invite some of our colleagues, just so we can kind of even out our little panel. So we're going to first invite Elizabeth Zell, 
So she's a user researcher at Bethesda Softworks Research Lab at id Software, marking her 10th anniversary in games this year, six in user research. She has a great, excellent background in working in small teams, also working as an embedded researcher. So she spent some time working at Volition, working on the Agents of Mayhem and Saints Row series. So she has a lot of knowledge working in small teams, wearing lots of hats, doing lots of amazing things. James Berg. <laughs> working user experience uh, research group at EA Canada, where he's worked for 10 years. So he's led research on pretty much a lot of the EA titles that we're familiar with. Yeah. <laughs> so he starts working with teams kind of throughout the production cycle. So he has a good understanding of kind of working with teams very early, all the way through the entire process, doing kind of heuristics evaluations and all those types of things. So we would like to invite any of you guys that have questions, specifically juniors, if you guys have any questions first, or if you seniors just want to question us on some of the presentation that we've given you. <laughs> I think it's quite obvious for somebody who um, is a designer, who's an artist, somebody who's built a, a video game before, to have a portfolio to put forth with a resume. Um, what would you suggest for somebody interested in games user research? What kind of portfolio do you think a hiring manager would be looking for? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't expect a portfolio usually. Um, I understand because I've worked in the industry, NDAs are real. And your ability to respect your NDA is very important to me as a hiring manager. Um, so basically for hiring for user research positions, um, I design my interview process around the fact that I'm not going to expect a portfolio from someone. If you do have research that you can show, that's fantastic. Um, you know, send me a link to wherever you have that um, online. But generally, I'm going to assume that not every candidate is going to be able to provide a portfolio, and I'm going to design my questions and written tests as a different way to um, kind of gauge what your skills are. Can I follow up and say, do you think that's the same for somebody who's never worked in games user research versus somebody who says, oh, I worked at you know, EA, but I, you know, I was under NDA, so I can't talk about that? Yeah. Um, I basically, my um, hiring process is going to be the same for everybody, so yeah, even um, for hiring for a completely entry-level position, I'm not going to have an expectation of a portfolio. If you have one, awesome, but it's not going to be something that's going to be required when I'm a hiring manager. Yeah, I mean, I've never gotten a formal portfolio when I've been doing hiring, or helping with hiring. Um, what I look for is if you have... Uh, have something up online that I can look at and see you talk about research in a way that makes sense, right? At that stage, looking at the portfolio, for me at least, I'm just looking to make sure you have covered your bases, right? You know about the core research methods that I need you to know about, and to get an idea of like, okay, they're not weak, or they're weak here, or they don't have information here, that's what I need to focus in on in a, on an interview. Um, and like Zell, it, we're not designers. Like our, if we do our jobs really well, most people don't know we exist. Right? So it's really hard to have a portfolio, and it's really hard to prove impact, too. Right? Like I've worked on a lot of different games, but if someone asked me to like prove that I made this game better, that'd be hard. So that's a really hard thing to ask a junior, especially, to have a portfolio for. Sorry, we'll move on to the next question. Hi. If you have more questions, we can talk about it later. Yeah. Sorry. My question's about mobile. Um, as the mobile remote testing space kind of evolves to make it easier, um, currently, I don't know if people know, but remote testing an app often requires an SDK build, engineering input. Um, how do you see remote play testing kind of evolving over the next five to ten years? Uh, okay. For all the reasons we described already, the observation of player behavior, and the ability to ask prompt, uh, follow up questions in a semi structured interview, I, I believe is going to be fundamentally a core part of the work that we're all going to continue to do moving forward. Is remote playtesting a voice in answering some of these questions? Yes, of course. Um, but I also want to think about who's conducting those analysis. As you've seen, it's not just about, uh, it's not just about doing a playtest. All that prep and all that analysis, that's the bulk of the work, and it's the bulk of our contribution. Uh, so I want to make sure those remote playtesting play services are used for what they're absolutely best for. Hey, uh, this is Kamar. Um, 
So please help me understand what happens, what is the role of Google Research when the, once the product is released? So what happens post-launch? I know for a uh, game as service, is perhaps a you know, long-term research project never finishes, yeah. but when if it's a one-time uh, product release, game release, uh, how do, what is the role of Google uh, after uh, the release? Um, I can tell you that the very first thing you do is when you start seeing reviews come in, you start analyzing every game review you can find, looking for where are the usability problems. Um, but nowadays, there's patches, there's updates to games, even post-launch. And so it's very important for your user research team to continue to be involved in any work that's being done on patches for your game, um, especially things for like combat balance or economy. Um, because it's a wonderful opportunity to start gaining a new kind of data because of the game analytics side. Um, once you ship a title and you have millions of units in the wild, you start just getting a wealth of data from play real players and how they're interacting. Um, and so having a games user research team who then can respond and help dev teams um, verify which issues are worth trying to address maybe in patch, um, helping to test patches because we'll do play testing with patches enabled um, with small settings to see is this in you know is the intent of this fix actually achieving it um, so especially as with games become more of a service user research remains really important at every stage as we identify problems and help the developers prioritize which ones they should work on addressing also, they might have questions that they want to know kind of what's going on if we're moving into another iteration of a game in the future. Sometimes we have some design questions. We want to take that information and build upon for a future future title. One quick thing to add. Um, Gerbil uh, has a chapter by Ian Livingston that talks about review analysis. Uh, full disclosure, Ian's my boss, but it's still a good chapter. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, so I'm uh, about to enter, I, I'm uh, asking questions more from the academic side. So I'm about to enter a, a graduate program and the research that I'm going to be doing in this program is not directly relevant to games, but I'm sort of interested in keeping it, uh, keeping it being a part of the community and in the future having this open as a possible career choice. Uh, what do you have suggestions for the upcoming years of what I can do to sort of stay in touch and improve my profile? So as someone who has gone through this fairly recently. <laughs> um, so I did actually some academic research that wasn't entirely related to games, but I still continue to attend the summit and kind of keep up on what was going on here. So kudos to you, you are here, so that's a great first step. So additionally, just kind of trying to keep up, maybe reading through different chapters in the, the Gerbil and looking through and kind of exploring and trying to work on skills that you feel like you could possibly integrate or work on kind of your spare time, work on kind of trying to learn how to do different usability reviews. I know there's been a lot of discussion on that lately in the Discord channel, so you can get caught up there as well. Another suggestion, if your school has a game design program, see if you can work with them. Say, hey, I'd like to practice my skills as a user researcher. Can I work with your game design students? You know, what are they working on their capstone project? Would you like to integrate playtesting into that? Um, I see a lot of that come, you know, in candidates I see who are especially looking at um, junior level roles is time basically them finding games to test. Like, let me find a way, even though it's not officially associated with my degree program, where can I find games? Um, so, yeah. Can confirm. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. Thank you. Um, yeah, I went to the game design program and just didn't leave. And they finally just allowed, yes, hi, yes, Ashley Reynolds. Um, so I was able to kind of work with some of the student teams and that was also really helpful. That was a great learning experience for all of us. So highly encourage you to do that if you can find even just indies in the area that you would be able to talk to as well. Thank you. Hi, uh, first off, thanks to Lenny and uh, Seb for the interesting talk. Uh, I have a question related to game analytics. So when using game analytics to track the issues in games, so what are the common methods like because uh, I believe uh, one way is to gather the player telemetry but that's the most common thing I'm finding but uh, can you help me understand a little bit uh, you know more of this the game analytics to track issues in games. Uh, it depends entirely on the tech stack of the studio that you're working with. Um, you know it 
it really, really varies. I don't know if there's really a lot of common methodology because it's we're all kind of just working against our limitations and doing the best we can. Um, I mean, Volition, I guess, had a pretty good. Yeah. So Volition started doing telemetry tracking with Scenes Row 2. Um, so, and I, um, I really love this quote from Matt White. Um, hi. hi. Where he, he came in and he looked at the data we collected on Saints Row 3 and he said, you're a bunch of bad thieves. You broke in, you had no idea it was valuable, so you just took it all. Um, so basically, it's gonna be, you know, it's like, you're working with completely different engines. Um, you're working that a lot of them don't have telemetry built in by default. That's getting more common, but that's, it's not standard yet. Um, and then it's your tech team that you have available to you, uh, for you. And then if you can manage to leverage them, because usually their complete, their schedule is completely full and they have no time to help you as a user researcher figure out this telemetry thing. Um, how much um, resources you can have for analysis. But yeah, it's gonna vary so widely. Um, but generally, get you, it's like the standard thing is get the telemetry in as early as possible so that your user research team can start interacting with your analytics team and whatever programming support you manage to you know, scramble together um, to try and start integrating use that kind of data into your testing processes as early as possible because it makes your testing better, but it also is testing the data analytics and the data collection. Um, so you can kind of sell it that way. But basically, the short answer is there's no universal standard yet. And so yeah, as James mentioned, every place is having to do it differently. And just to add to that, as soon as you have that in, as soon as you have a sliver of that, everyone is going to want more. Yeah. And it creates kind of a self-creating cycle where it's like, hey, I can show you where your people are on heat maps. And they're cool. What were they doing there? And like, well, we don't have telemetry for that. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Oh, okay. now we have telemetry for that. And then that creates, now they want to know more and more and more. So it's a great way to get buy-in at your studio to, to make that happen. Everyone loves heat maps. They're real pretty. <laughs> yeah. Visuals, do not overlook, yeah. do not underestimate the importance of visuals to designers. Like yeah. You can give them all the qualitative word vomit that you want to, show them a pretty picture that tells them something interesting that they didn't know, and that's where you're going to get the best buy-in. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi guys, thanks so much for doing this. Um, so as someone who is coming from a non-traditional uh, psychology, HCI background, I actually just graduated in biochemistry and I'm trying to make the transition over to user research. What kind of advice could you guys give me and any other person? <laughs> All right, so hi, my name is Liz Zelli and my degree is in marine biology. <laughs> Um, so yeah, if you want to talk about a non-traditional entry into GER, I'm like a poster child for it. Um, what I can say, you know, and I emphasize this on my resume, um, I went to a really strong research institution. So yeah, I may have learned how to study fish and algae, but the fundamentals of research are universal. I can design studies, I can conduct tests, I can analyze data, I can report this. Um, but then what I had to do when I first started working in GER was I had to, on the side, start brushing up hard on the psych because that's not what I had studied. Luckily, there's a ton of resources out there. So basically, um, the GER Bible is a great place to start, um, but basically just anything that you can grab your hands onto. Like, I bought a textbook about cognitive load theory, you know, and read that in my spare time, which isn't something most people do for fun. Yeah, but it's really important to the kind of work that you know, I'm doing now. And so basically, um, find as much stuff as you can read to help you transition um, and just leverage the fact that you know you have strong research background. Put that front, you know, front and forward. Like, I can do the research and I'm going to spin myself up on the kind of the site and the HCI that I may have missed out on in school. Thank you. <laughs> I'll just add to that from someone who had no background in this and stumbled into it. Yeah. These days, that doesn't cut it. Um, I got really lucky to be in the right time in the right place. And replicating the path without having that background is almost impossible now. Like you saw in that slide, you know, 60% of people have master's degrees now. If you don't have a good basis in that research, we're not interested in talking to you. It, it is too much effort to train you up on the research side of things. Um, you need to come with that. That's table stakes these days. Thank you. Hi guys, uh, thank you for doing this talk. I'm sure it's helpful for all of us. Um, other senior advisors like you guys have mentioned uh, conducting user research on like um, the game developer lab or indie studios. If you don't already have that kind of framework, 
how do, would you go about doing that? Like, if you if you don't already have the report sure. structure or things sure. like that. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah. So the, <laughs> so, the, so the Games Use Research Book, and you know, there's many uh, papers and the exploration of essential heuristics. Where, you know, these rules of the farm, these lenses, they try to summarize the voice of game user research. Uh, and in fact, there's a market talk about uh, some new ones later today, uh, too, actually. So most people in, in, our, in these seats have not been able to run their own user research in their own time in order to get a job, right? That's, that's a hell of a lot of work, and it's not an expectation. If you can do it, fantastic. Uh, if you can't, there, there are ways to practice finding this voice. There's a ways to practice looking at games through these lenses, uh, by using heuristic sets, by reading the game user research book, uh, and practicing developing those outputs. Write a usability report. Write a blog about the best inventory system you can find. Uh, you know, be playing games not just for enjoyment, but through science. Write, just write it down. Write, write things down. Uh, and, and through that practice, you can, as I say, generate new skills, and then maybe have something for a portfolio. Thank you. Um, so, as kind of a caution, addition to that. Don't put something up online that looks like terrible research when you are not clearly marking this like on a website or a blog or whatever that says, hey, I'm, I'm learning and I'm trying to figure this out. Because if you apply and I Google and the first thing that shows up is your like personal web page with terrible research and you haven't clearly made, it, made the case that I'm trying to learn how to do this, that just to me looks like, great, you're incompetent. Next. <laughs> uh, so if you're doing that, if you're showing interest, it can work either really strongly for you because you know, like people like Lainey or Hannah like they have taken that path and it's working really well, um, so it can be a, an immense positive. But just cross your cross your eyes and dot your t's. Sorry, we have time for just a couple more. Nikki, we'll get to you. <laughs> um, right. Sorry. Uh, so during your month, when you or like a typical month, uh, when you work on projects, uh, I don't. No, if you did go into detail, but what kind of projects do you work on? Like, very specifically. Because I think. Very specifically? <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, it, you don't generally just work, oh, let's just do research on this one game. You work on, like, an element of the game, right? So, right. what kind well, of. And it can vary. Okay. I mean, like, for me, so I guess. Zelly and I can maybe speak to kind of contrasting things. Okay. I work on a single game. Okay. I work on a single brand. So that means working on kind of different aspects of the game, like you're saying. So we may not be running a full test of just playing that one thing. We may be looking at different aspects of the usability or any other things like that, where maybe Zelly is working on something where she's doing a lot of tests on a lot of different projects. This is something that's going to vary a lot. It's really hard for us to say one standardized way or another, even though I know it's like extremely fascinating when you're trying to figure it out. Um, so sometimes you also have questions from the designers and the developers, and you're doing something completely one-off, kind of doing, you know, maybe you're doing some paper prototyping testing with them or answering some other types of questions. So it's going to vary a bit. All right, and then uh, one more thing. So I am um, still in school, and I haven't interviewed for a job in a while. <laughs> um, I did for like an internship, um, but that was like one interview. And it sounds like you said um, that you do like some testing. So what kind of things, <laughs> the or how does an interview well, process look like? Okay, great. So there's a talk. The one the talk I mentioned, uh, Lenny mentioned earlier. I interviewed a load of hiring managers from across the games user research space. Asked them some, you know, roughly what the hiring structure was, and how they how they did this okay. process, and presented a kind of generalized version. That talks on YouTube. It's 15 minutes flat, okay, and it'll right. give you an idea about not the answers, but just you know, right. roughly yeah. how yes. this works. Okay. Yeah. Uh, forging a career in games user research. It was from London, 2015. Thank you. Hey. So a lot of the research techniques I've learned are mostly from grad school. So what would you recommend for undergrads? Because I've guest lectured some courses in HCI, and usually they ask me, like, how did you get started? And I say, I don't want to say, my advisor threatened me. <laughs> <laughs> I do not answer this. I mean, so you have, you're saying you're. Like, a lot of the techniques I've learned are from like the one year of grad school I've taken, and just like me going out and learning it myself. Okay. So, as someone who did not go to grad school, 
Okay. Yeah, like undergraduates. Right. Like a lot of these techniques. They yeah. Do. No, I'm saying like personally yeah, speaking. Okay. So I got my bachelor's, but I was working on. I had my studio at the time, so I was working and running research through there. So I mean, it's not necessarily entirely required that you have this research experience. If you don't get any research experience and tell your masters. You want that. That that's the experience that you want. If you can get research experience in your undergrad, absolutely do that. <laughs> okay, so I'll just convince them to join my lab. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. So I'll be really quick. So uh, playtests don't have to be that long. Uh, actually, I'm going to run out here because these guys are running much longer studies. Uh, playtests that we do are actually probably significantly shorter most of the time. One day of prep, one day of testing seven players, one after the other, and then one day of analysis, the rubble goes out at the end of the day. This, this stuff is long and complicated because it needs to be, because of the kind of games we're representing here. But you can play test, you can get access to this more, more quickly and more, more cheaply. Uh, maybe not in your spare time, but you know. Last um, question. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Uh, so this is just following up on a conversation that James and I had at lunch, where you know everyone here is obviously really interested in games research. There's only so many positions in industry that are available, and uh, not many of us hopefully are like dying at any time soon, so like it's gonna be hard to get into But like it's not like games user research is the only place. <laughs> yeah, sorry uh, it's, like, it's, <laughs> like, <laughs> dark <real> <laughs> uh, it's not like in game companies that games user research teams or user research teams specifically are the only places that hire researchers um, And I was just wondering if you guys could talk for the people who are like getting ready to finish and everything of other places in your company is that research is happening um, that they might also be looking into besides just GER teams? Uh, marketing, business intelligence, brand. Um, these are all areas, it's like, um, and especially if you have a company that ha manages its own backend servers and you want to, you're really interested in like telemetry support, um, there's usually like an entire team that's dedicated to collecting telemetry across your company. Um, these are all areas that leverage research and research skills to different degrees. Um, so you don't need to just be looking at titles that are listed as games user researcher. Market research, BI researcher, data analysts, you know, things like that are also angles. So if you want to get into games and do research, but not necessarily have your heart set on running a play test, there are a lot of different angles that you can try and come into the games industry through. Yeah. All right, that's all we have time for. Thank you, everybody.